August has come to an end and with it, so has one of the best months for games we've gotten this year. Sure, we are all aware of the Armored Cores and Baldur's Gate 3s that are deservedly doing the rounds, but the month was incredibly good for indie games too and I don't see nearly enough people talking about that. Well, actually, there are plenty of people talking about that, but my script flows better if I pretend there aren't, so just bear with me. That's why I figured I had to be the change that I want to see in the world and decided to take matters into my own hands with my very curated list of indie games that you must check out from August 2023. There are five in total, or seven I guess, if you count the intro and outro footage. As per usual, I try to select different genres, so hopefully there should be something for everyone here. I haven't talked about most of these games on my channel before, so even if you're already a subscriber, this should be fully fresh content for you. And if you're not a subscriber, what are you doing? Subscribe already. Last but not least, keep in mind that these titles are must-plays, sure, but only in my opinion. At the end of the day, tastes vary and you might enjoy something I normally don't and vice versa. This is why I try to provide a varied list, in hopes that you will find something here for you. Even just one game. Without further ado, here we go! While some people are exploring the Sea of Stars and Starfield, I urge you to consider exploring the game Sea of Stars instead. The game is to 2023 what Chained Echoes was to 2022. That is, potentially the best indie JRPG of the year, and probably even some people's favorite title. Though it might be a bit too early for us to say that about 2023, right? Let's revisit the topic at the end of the year, shall we? Made by the same minds behind the excellent platformer The Messenger, which I unfortunately have yet to play. Heresy, I know. Sea of Stars represents their foray into a completely new genre. Sometimes, with genre shifts like these, it's hard to end up with a quality product, but the folks at Sabotage Studio absolutely nailed the jump from platformer to turn-based JRPG. The game boasts a really nice soundtrack, fun exploration with really cool mobility that allows your character to swim, climb, vault, jump, amongst others, and the art style is absolutely gorgeous. While some folks have been dissatisfied with the writing, the story is engaging enough to keep one interested throughout the game. But perhaps the best part is the combat, at least in my opinion. The turns and their move orders are not what you might expect from other JRPGs such as via an agility stat, oh no. Instead, you start a battle with all your characters being able to move once, and you choose who goes first, second, etc. Once all characters have had one turn, their actions refresh and you can choose from all of them again. It's a pretty satisfying loop that also rewards strategy in choosing who goes first. And if you're wondering how the enemies fit into this, well, take a look at the stopwatch next to their health. That's the number of turns, or actions, until the enemy acts. Some enemies also get icons before they attack. If you deal damage of the types indicated by the icons, like blunt or solar damage, and manage to knock out all the icons before the stopwatch runs out, you cancel their turn. Usually, this is an option only before moves that will utterly wreck your shit, so it's a good idea to always try to cancel them. And honestly, this is just the beginning. You can also expect combo moves, timed button presses that enhance your moves, a nice difficulty level, limited amount of items you can carry, which is, weirdly enough, a good thing, and plenty more features that actually help the game's combat system stand out amongst lots of other indie JRPGs. There's more I could and probably should say, but instead I'll just urge you to go play the demo yourself. Or, heck, play the entire game. It's available as a day one release on both Game Pass and PlayStation Plus Deluxe, so you might already have the game in one of those. Genuinely a great way to spend 20-30 to 30 hours of your time and a must-play for JRPG fans. Come on. 
I usually like to start these game introductions with a little tongue-in-cheek comment, some sarcastic dumb joke, stuff like that, but I would actually have done this game a disservice if I didn't start its section with its incredible soundtrack and movement. This game doesn't need me to sell it, oh no, it down sells itself as soon as you so much as look at it. But I'll talk about it anyway and you cannot stop me. Bonebrush Cyberfunk is a spiritual successor to the Jet Set Radio duology made by fans of the original games. And damn does it show. They even got the composer of the original duology to create a couple of tracks for this one, just so you have an idea of their dedication. As I said in my video about the title, which is gonna be linked in the screen right now, the developers understood what made those two games so good and set out to recreate the magic. And recreate it they did. You play as a guy that loses his head and has it replaced by a robot head, as is the normal reaction in a situation like this, which you know is a very mundane situation. Robot head guy is pissed that he was decapitated and wants his original head back. Understandable, really. However, this foe is the leader of the biggest team around and as such he must work his way there by beating all the other teams in the way. His goal just so happens to align with some other folks who invite him into their own gang, Bomb Rush Cyberfunk. So how do we take on these teams you might ask? Well by skating, bicycling and roller skating our way to victory. The game is based on doing grinds, manuals and all sorts of tricks to build up points and reach tag spots. Tagging places earns you rep, get enough rep and you get the attention of the map's team, eventually culminating in a fight in which both sides must try to get as many points as possible within a time limit. But this doesn't even begin to scratch the surface, oh no. You can fight the police, find all sorts of collectibles like new rides and characters to use, the soundtrack and visuals are absolutely fantastic, and the game is just incredibly damn fun. I beat it after 9 or so hours and I just didn't want to stop playing, which is good considering there is even more secrets unlocked after finishing the game. If you want to hear more about the game, I'll leave my videos with thoughts on it in the description and again on the screen. And if you like what you're seeing here, get the game, it's awesome. Blasphemous. Adjective. Considered offensive to God or religion. A blasphemous remark. Yes, I just read the Cambridge Dictionary definition for blasphemous because I'm pretty sure that's enough to sell the game on any atheist that might be watching. Or JRPG fans, since you're always killing God in those games. But jokes aside, the title refers basically to the game's theme, which is religious in nature with clear inspirations from Spanish Catholicism. That being said, however, this is an original fantasy world and doesn't use any of our actual figures. And since I have no better place to plug this, a Spanish priest actually reacted to the original game in a video. Go watch it, it's pretty cool. I'll link it in the description. Did I spend a good paragraph talking about the game's themes? Yes. And there's a reason for that. It's genuinely the thing that enchanted me the most about the first Blasphemous title, and that remains the case here. In fact, I would argue that the presentation of said theme only got better in the sequel. The game can still be fully played in Spanish, the pixelated graphics are still outstanding, and so is the sound design as a whole. And this time, the cutscenes fittingly adopted the most heretic art style ever, anime. Well, it's actually more of a cartoon style, but the truth doesn't really fit my joke, so I'm going with anime. This change was quite possibly the most controversial one from Blasphemous 1, and I feel like if something like this is the most controversial thing about a game, then the game is doing great. As for actual gameplay, Blasphemous 2 is a metroidvania through and through, or more than the first game was at least. You find upgrades throughout the map, usually guarded by bosses, that allow you to explore previously inaccessible areas, thus slowly working your way towards your ultimate goal. The sequel now features three main weapons that can be freely used at any time once unlocked and they all feel pretty good to use. And thus, alongside the powers you can acquire, combat feels great. Which is the most important thing, really. The boss design is still awesome and so are the set pieces and maps you'll be working your way through. Although, I have to say there's more platforming this time around. At least, that was my impression. If you've been enjoying what you've been seeing on the camera, please don't sleep on Blasphemous 2. I promise it'll give you over 10 hours of fantastic side-scrolling action-focused goodness. If 
you're anything like me, you grow up learning some stories related to Zoro, Three Musketeers, and Akin. You also love the Puss in Boots character in Shrek, or the movies that came after, and you've always had the secret desire of kicking barrels into people to make them roll down a flight of stairs. Wait, why are you looking at me with such concern in your eyes? I don't have anger issues, I promise. But, well, if any of what I said tickles your fancy, then boy do I have some news for you. August 16th marked the release of the one and only swashbuckler action game, End Guard. You'll play as a lady called the Dahlia the Volador as she defends her city against the powers that be and four delightfully action-packed missions. That does mean that yes, the game is not super long, clocking in at 3-4 to four hours for the campaign, but damn it, those were some of the best 3-4 to four hours I spent in the entire month. Plus, you also eventually unlock arena mode in which you get a perk system and engage with lots of challenging fights, potentially extending that playtime for quite a few hours. And god, this is pretty much what I've been showing on screen. You play as a duelista, fencer if you want to be less cool about it, and that's such, you really only know how to deal with one enemy at a time. That's too bad, considering the game throws you a lot more than one enemy at a time. So what do you do about that? Why, you toss all manners of objects into people and temporarily remove folks from the fight so you can deal with enemies one at a time. And I mean it, the game has insanely fun levels of environmental fuckery. See this pot? You can throw it at an enemy's head and get him out of the fight while he tries to figure out a way to remove the pot. This weapon rack? Try kicking an enemy into it and get them stuck. A barrel? Kick it downstairs and knock down a whole damn crew. Heck, you can even fire cannons into your enemies. It's a lot of fun. But what do you do when you're one on one? Well, as the devs say, you parry, repost and lunge your way to victory, of course. Some attacks can be parried, others must be dodged, but all of them can be managed if you play well. Enemy types are also often introduced, with many requiring specific strategies and ways to deal with them. One example is a lady that runs from you and tosses explosives your way. Why run after her when you can just toss a lunch in her way and make her explosives blow up, knocking her and all the enemies in her vicinity out? As you can tell, the game is also pretty hilarious and managed to get some good giggles out of me. Honestly, this title is super underrated and I urge you to give it a shot. It deserves the attention. And speaking of underrated titles, we have the last one in this list, WrestleQuest. Oh, wait, hold on, wrong music. Ah, there we go. Honestly, playing this game has exposed me to so much macho manliness that I'm pretty sure my testosterone levels doubled, which may or may not be cause for concern. Are there any doctors watching that can help me with that? While I await said help, I might as well talk about the game since it's what you guys want to hear. The art direction, character design and soundtrack are all really good and fitting of the theme. The story is probably one of the better ones in the very limited wrestling game scene, but honestly, I think the biggest praise I can give this game is that the developers are clear fans of wrestling and it shows. The game references real-life events, has lots of jokes related to the theme, and even 30-plus licensed wrestlers make their appearance in the game, including names that you might be very familiar with, such as Macho Man Randy Savage and Andre the Giant. As you help Muchacho Man, one of the main characters on his journey to wrestling success, you will recruit 12 playable characters that can join your fights in teams of 3 at a time, plus a supporting manager. The fights and overall gameplay are all very akin to a turn-based JRPG, but wrestling themed. Fights take place in rings, the terminology is all fitting to wrestling, such as gimmicks instead of skills, and you can even knock enemies out permanently by pinning them. The battle system is, unfortunately for some, very reliant on quick-time events, but you can thankfully skip those in the option menu. But the biggest innovation here is the hype bar at the bottom of the screen. The game is all about spectacle and wowing the crowd, and there are multiple ways to do that. Every wrestler has an archetype that you can freely change at any moment. Said archetype influences which actions build hype. Example, a support archetype makes people hyped up by healing others. The hype bar is vital because it gets you buffs in battle. But wrestling is about theatrics, right? Or so I'm told because I don't actually know wrestling. 
and as such you can hype the crowd even before the battle. Your walk to the ring and your trash talking of your rivals are all very important parts of gameplay, which is simply awesome. Every part of what I said above, especially the pre-match elements, just feels so fun to watch and get through. That's not to say the game is without issues, as there are really long loading screens, especially on the Switch, the game's overworld exploration feels sluggish at best, and the experience can be glitchy at times. However, the developers are actively listening and working on improving the game, so these annoyances will soon be gone. Last thing I want to mention, the design of the fighters and overall arts of the game are incredible, and so is the soundtrack. When it's there anyway, as some areas do lack OST. If you're a wrestling fan and want to spend some 30-something hours with a game, this is a no-brainer. And with that, we have reached the end of this little list. It was tough to get it down to 5 games this month, because honestly we got so many quality titles, and the same goes for the AAA sphere too. I would do a video on those as well, but 5 AAA games is a lot more expensive of an investment than 5 indie games, so you'll just have to trust my word on the quality of the AAA releases for now. If you have any suggestions, or if you feel like I missed an important indie game, please do let me know and I'll check it out. At the end of the day, all I want is to talk and learn more about games, so I'm down for anything. I hope this list helped you find something you might want to play, and if it did, make sure to let me know down in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, if it was useful to you, please do leave a like and subscribe as both actions really help out my channel. But above all else, drop a comment with your thoughts, I love hearing about them. That aside, thank you so much for watching and I'll catch you hopefully in the next video. Bye bye! <laughs>